Um, it's wonderful to be able to host somebody who's passing through, and and, and uh, she's generous enough to be able to uh, give us an informal talk based on her work on uh, really a, an amazing phenomenon, which was which has been uh, you know an experiment in uh, giving. Uh, participatory democracy to the people of cities who live in incredibly un unequal environments. And so the question is, what has happened uh, to the rights of the city? Uh, not so much what David Harvey talks about in his abstract writing, but more what happens on the ground. Sure, sure. But Dr. Uh, Clarissa Freitas is a PhD from the University of Brasilia. She's done a postdoc uh, Fulbright uh, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where she got to uh, imbibe in the cosmopolitan culture of the Midwest, <laughs> which, and, I, and I'm using her words, uh, that she had a great time there. And, uh, and she's, been work, she's been working, uh, she, she teaches in, interesting enough in Brazil, uh, you know, urban studies sits in departments of architecture and urban planning, uh, really on the ground in interesting ways. And so that her students actually get to do some sort of, uh, you know, urban design projects in favelas and interact in the city in ways that maybe, uh, you know, a ge geography program might not offer. So it's really wonderful and it's really a, a great pleasure to introduce. Oh, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. Film your introduction, you was very generous. Thank you very much. Well, and thank you for, you know, having interest in, in hearing me and receiving me here. So this makes my trip much meaningful when I get to know much more of the cosmopolitan culture of the Midwest because there is some cosmopolitan culture here and you tend not to think there is, but there is. I was just talking about how my kids who lived here in Champaign get to know much more of the world than they did in back there in Fortaleza. So it's, it's a, a very nice environment. Thank you very much for you to receiving me and for Professor Michael. Uh, okay, so this is a draft from uh, that I have presented in the World Planning School Congress in Rio de Janeiro this July. So it's about the same presentation and it's actually a, more of a uh, attempt to theoretically understand what, hap what happened in, in urban policy in Brazil in this last two decades. That we, we tend to say that we have institutionalized some of the right to the city movements and something very interesting had happened down there, but uh, something had also not worked, so that's what I, I've tried to make it understand, understandable for uh, people who are not from Brazil, and I hope I will make this message clear enough. So maybe you haven't understood the picture that is on the flyer, so I, I'd like to start by, by talking about it. This is a, a formally designed subdivision, and behind it, it's the real system, this real system, urban system that exists. So I have, and I think this is a metaphor for how planning works in, in my place in Brazil, and maybe in a lot of places, that planning tends to idealize a, a design or a policy <coughs> that does not look in the real conditions that people uh, live in. So this, I think this tells a lot. And as I, I teach in the design disciplines, I tend to uh, make people see, you know, maps and, and reality, how, how they are designed and how this, this design is not really appropriate to what happens on the ground. So um, behind it, it's one of the favelas, or I would call it informal settlements. We don't tend to use favelas very much in the Northeast, though. It's favela, it's much more of a South is a word, it's a Rio de Janeiro word in, in Brazil. So if I call them the residence favelas, they would say, no, no, this is a community. This is not a favela. So favela doesn't have the same meaning as it has it in Rio de Janeiro, which is more of a progressive liberty, no liberty meaning of it. So uh, this is uh, behind, uh, behind the plant subdivision. It's uh, an informal settlement that was uh, struck by the uh, construction of a light rail transit system and much of the residents 
here were evicted or were supposed to be evicted, but they fight for it. They have fought for it, and they succeeded in, in pushing the via the light rail system uh, to this empty plot, and not to like diminish a lot the, the amount of addiction. So it's one of the places that I work with in, in Fortaleza. So okay, the the title of the talk or the article is "Right to the City and Insurgent Practices." Insights from two decades of right to the city law in Brazil. So we tend to, to, to refer to this legislation as right to the city law. And uh, I'm trying to uh, talk here with this concept of insurgency, that it's something that is not very present in Brazil, but the, the notion is that I want to use the Brazilian experience to understand to what extent what we've done in Brazil is really insurgent. So that, that is my main question of research. Okay, so what is planning and what is citizenship? We've been talking, I mean, there's a, a, a field of research internationally that talks about insurgent planning and insurgent citizenship, what is it? So planning, what I tend to understand planning here is a field of action capable of intervening in the city building process in the name of public interest. So actually this word or this concept of public interest is something that should be more politicized in my point of view. And so planning tends to not to really think too much about this concept. And that is one of my critiques of the planning uh, literature or, or way of thinking. So <laughs> citizenship is another thing that is related to it. <laughs> citizenship talks about who interests, who uh, deserves, uh, who belongs to that society, you know, who deserves to, to have the public to have the interest that could be considered in, in planning policies. So it's defined as the political component of planning, defines belonging to that society. So if you do not belong, I will not plan for your interest, something like that. So <coughs> citizens' rights are used to define and materialize public interest. So after we kind of think a little bit more about what public interest means, I, I pose this question in general not really even talking about Brazil, is planning inherently progressive? So what public interest does planning really look at? Uh, that's the structure of the paper and the presentation. So I am evaluating the right to the city planning to understand that question. First I talk a little bit about theory and then Brazil and then <laughs> specific case of our Taliza periphery and how insurgent movements have a question this planning uh, episode, let's say, like that. So in terms of theory, planning theory always talk about how planning might be used as an instrument of power and we've had the kind of uh, progressive planning policies that, you know, US literature talk about equity planning, advocacy planning, participatory planning, community development, and then there is this new concept of insurgent planning, meaning that it is done not by professional planners, but it's done outside the state, you know, outside, by, by the residents themselves. So in, in this discussion of, over here, there is a great incorporation of specificities of the South. I use much of my former advisor work, which is Professor Farnak Mraftad from University of Illinois, to uh, conceptualize what insurgent planning means. It's, it, it gets a message of self-determination and resi resistance, and uh, they are mainly comprised of activities conducted by disenfranchised urban citizens, aimed at transforming urban policies to meet their needs. So professional planners might be or might not be involved in, in this kind of uh, activity that it's usually framed as insurgent. So, uh, following her work, it's insurgent planning is not any act of resistance, but one that responds what she calls new Liberian specificities of dominance. So, insurgency would would respond to a new Liberian ways of thinking, systems of values, not really only new Liberian defined in terms of economy, but of systems of values. Uh, she, she talks about, you know, invited and invented spaces of participation, meaning that the invited spaces are the participatory planning, but the invented spaces come from protest and resistance outside the, 
the establishment. So in Brazil, <laughs> we we did have a important rise of new liberal ideology uh, after the redemocratization that uh, we experienced after the, the end of the dictatorship in '85. So we've had, you know, in the same time we've had new liberalism and we have right to the city policy, you know, at the same time. So how that how have this played out in, in the policy? So what I call new liberal systems of values is embedded in this this picture over here, where you know this more individualized way of thinking. Uh, so okay, okay, now Brazil. Uh, grassroots struggle for land rights since the 70s. This has been framed as insurgents by anthropologist, I guess he is, James Hawson. Uh, 1988 constitution, our national constitution, uh, after the redemocratization, expanded the citizenship rights. We have a lot of collective rights, you no know, rights to environment, rights to heritage protection, rights, and, and also rights to the city. So right to the city in the constitution means that every property has to obey its social function. So it's not only uh, uh, prop the use of property has to be not only accountable for the owner's interest, but to that collectivity interest, you know, the, the public interest, and and this should be uh, set up or designed and defined in the municipal master plans. So in this sense, the, each municipality has to revise or you know construct new master plans defining what is the social function of each plot of land in that city. You know, that is pretty, uh, maybe not that feasible with the kind of state that we have, but it is really progressive in, in theoretical terms. You know, it's, it's a curb on, on the private property uh, point of view. That the state have legitimate uh, way of intervening in the, in the market in this sense. So the guidelines for what social functions means was set by the Statute of the City of Federal Legislation in 2001. Uh, and this was implemented after the Workers' Party uh, took office in, in 2001. It took office in 2002, actually. Uh, and so the Workers' Party administrator set up the Ministry of Cities, who uh, set up a big campaign, political campaign, sensibilization for the mayors to revise their master plans in according to this new guideline, you know, that you should regulate private property in the name of the public. Uh, well, in, in my point of view, there, there are two major sorts of changes after the statute of the city, that uh, changes in, in the planning policy. One is that informal precarious settlements, the Brazilian favela, has increased legitimacy. Now it's difficult. It, it's more politically uh, cost, costly for for politicians to evict favela in, in this by claiming that they are illegal, because we kind of devise a whole set of understanding that favelas have some legitimacy because the urban development, the formal urban development, had not included them. So this is one of the major sources of changes. And the other is the decision-making process of these plans that were very technocratic before. They started to be more politicized. Okay, so there is the statute of the city and this right to the city policy was really an uh, important move toward a more progressive and a major rupture with the technocratic planning model that we've had before. And it was something that we in, in Brazil have uh, have constructed. It was not something that we've copied from abroad, you know. So it was really something unique. Uh, with some similar experience in other Latin American countries. So how did, as I told you, the master plans were to be devised by each municipality. So this this whole struggle to how to regulate land was shifted from the federal to the local levels, and each municipality has reached it, its own political agreement. Now I'm going to talk about Fortaleza, which is here, and that's where I flew from, see, very far away from Rio de Janeiro and São Paulo, which is in the southeast. 
we did our master plan, which is called Plan de Directo Participativo. We've approved it in 2009, not after two years, uh, I would say six years of big debates, come and go, come and go, and, and all of that. But the first version of the plan action was, was withdrawn, and we have to start over again in 2006, because uh, public ministry has said that it was not participatory enough, you know? So it, it, this notion of participation actually reached the ground. 3% uh, of territory in Fortaleza was set aside for social housing, which is also huge, even though we, we have a bigger demand for social housing. Just the fact that land was set aside for social housing, which, is, which was good land, service in land, and private land, it's, it's very meaningful, okay? So there was the inversion of priorities, investments according to the plan guidelines, investments were to be uh, channeled to the peripheral areas, <laughs> infield development in the center by fighting vacant idle services land. But then, right after the approval of the plan, the end of 2009, Fortaleza was chosen as one of the World Cup uh, sites, cities. So World Cup and also the real estate boom and the, the big housing program had diverted these guidelines and we were not really able to implement much of the, the guidelines that are here. And so, as in many other Brazilian cities, there is a widespread feeling that, despite the status of the Cidade, we did not achieve inclusion. But what I'm questioning here is actually this feeling. Is that, what I'm saying is that not really despite the status of the Cidade, but maybe because of this more inclusionary, participatory language that we, we were able to uh, actually divert from <laughs> inclusionary guidelines that, that we've had. Okay, I have five more minutes. You have more time. Okay, I bet I will show you for you. <laughs> so that's what I call the misuse of rights talk. You know, so you have rights, everybody has rights, but I do something very different and nobody questions me. And then there is this more fluid language, which is very different from the more technocratic planning language that you are illegal, you have to be out from here. You know what I mean? So that, that there, is, there was a shift in, in politics uh, language, in the ideology language, that really helped in pushing for a lot of exclusionary outcomes that we have seen, <coughs> seen before. So this inclusionary language internalized in formal, you know, inclusionary planning documents has constituted an important element to perpetuate this more regressive practice. This claim, I mean, this is some of the recent Brazilian literature that have been pushing for the same set of arguments. And uh, I've actually chosen three instances in a peripheral neighborhood of Fortaleza, which is called Bon Jardim, that this participatory master plan uh, have had developments in, in, in this peripheral region that even though, I mean, or maybe because of the uh, adopted this inclusionary land, they, uh, planning language, they were able to push for exclusionary investments. And I don't have time to, to talk about the three instances, I'll show you only one. Uh, okay, so this is a map of the municipality of Fortaleza, just for you to get a sense of the imbalances of, of the geography of the city. This is land values, you know, the east part has more services, and if so it's more expensive. It has also more uh, environmental protected area, but people live in the West, you know, because we, we are a poor community. So uh, people live here in the unserviced and less protected part. And so this is density, each dot, I think it's 100 in something like that. And, and this is the neighborhood that I'm talking about. And I like, I work a lot with them, the, the community leaders of Bon Jardim. So, these are the three instances that I talk about in the, the paper. Uh, the one is the Operação Urbana Consociada of Bon Jardim, which is the one I'm talking about. It's, uh, this is one, the other one is the participatory planning or participatory budget uh, investment 
planning that's been in common in that Mahakos is still in in Bojantin. And the other one is the upgrading of an, of all the informal settlements that are by this river called Manangapin River, which they constructed this big, uh, they call it landscape uh, promenade something avenue, which is very not really uh, good, not really at the end of the residence. But that's it. Okay, so in the paper I talk about the three instances of planning developments in the region in using this more inclusionary language. So I'm, I'm talking only about now in the talk, I'll, talk, I'll discuss only the Operação Urbana Consorciada, which is a public private partnership, maybe something close to the seeds, the special tax districts that you have in the US or they call it seeds in South Africa, I guess. So it's a special district where you can waive some of the planning regulations. And not by coincidence, this is the limit of this more flexible language, but this green part, uh, zoning uh, area here, it was set aside for environmental protection. So it, it flexibilized, it, it, it waived some of the environmental requirements that plane have been able to put in, in this place. So, and this was done in the name of the right to the city, which, but how come, how do they do that? I mean, how is this in the name of the right to the city? So this is Operação uh, Consorciada, our special district where private investments are encouraged in exchange for alteration of building subdivision requirements. So in this sense, what was uh, altered was the environmental regulations. Uh, in Bonjardin, the boundaries of the PPP coincides with the most disputed land of the region. That is because it coincides with this road over here, which is an important road, important point of access. So the land by this road, it's the more valuable land, okay? And they don't want to have the environmental regulations limits on this land. Language of flexibilization, exceptionalism, you know, in the name of economic development, uh, in the name of market efficiency, I don't need much regulations for the market to thrive, government inefficient, you know, it's not, I'm not, they use very much this language, government will not be able to protect the environment, so private companies will come here and set aside some small uh, green area for, for the environment to be protected. So there is pretty much a, a new Liberia systems of values uh, being pushed in under this uh, planning episode. Participation also. There is civil society participation in defining, in defining which regulations are going to be waived. But what they call civil society are landowners and permanent residents, not the renters, you know, not the, the, the informal residents and so on. The board composition also that discuss that that plan for the, the special district represent the entire city. They don't have specific uh, residents of the region that have fought for the environmental protection before, during the, uh, the elaboration of the master plan. So it's, it's really a very uh, exclusionary thing to set aside that land now to, to big corporations because that road, this is that road <coughs> two decades ago and this is a pro protest of the informal residents of the, that periphery fighting for investments, you know, and so they, they, they thought that maybe the investment would come to benefit them and now the, the way that the regulations is being set up will actually fix them because land is becoming very expensive for them. So it's, it's really a structural problem that they have. And all this was done in the name of the right to the city, you know? So they, they don't think that the plan and the right to the city legislation did represent them. And then I, I kind of, I learned a lot <coughs> on what they do, and I've called them insurgents because they do f fight against some of the new Liberian uh, discourses and right to the city official institutionalization that have been done 
in the, the planning establishment, in the government establishment. So what I call them <coughs> attitude insurgents because they they have this attitude of not giving up political confrontation when it's necessary. And it, it's a kind of refusing what in the literature have been called slave activism, that even though I have I have to be activist only when I am not politically affiliated with those in power, but if those in power are are my friends, I don't protest. You know, they have refused this kind. And it's very difficult to find residents who have done so. Most of the residents are caught up in this clientelistic politics mode of thinking that workers' party administrators have, have done a lot in Brazil. Uh, this is some of pictures of them. <coughs> Members see the structural components missing in planning practices. They, <laughs> they hate non-emancipatory participation that has become common throughout Brazil. They see that investments might come with gentrification, so sometimes they, they fight, they fight against investments. Uh, rights comes with obligations, so they say that we are we we have done our duties, we pay taxes, we we are citizens. So they even fight for land use control, even though they are informal residents, you know. They don't want to occupy all the places. They fight for protection of the, the land close to the rivers and the, the lakes and so on, because they understand that they need these open spaces. So they fight against the swindlers that go there and informally occupy the land. They dialogue with the state, of course, but yeah, the state is rarely seen as an ally. So this uh, talk about invited and invited spaces of participation is also pretty present on, on what they do. And they have an awareness that their participation might be used to legitimize exclusionary practices. So, so for me, they are the real insurgents, not really the official right to the city policy, but what the residents have done uh, in order to dialogue with them. So <coughs> they are a collectivity of movements. By being collectivity, they prevent cooptation of individual associations. They made efforts to reinforce the consciousness of citizenship because most of the residents don't feel that they deserve investments because they are informal, because they are poor, because they don't know how to read. So there is the, uh, an understanding that they need to be understood, that to understand themselves as, as citizens because most of the residents don't see that they deserve that investment. So when they get some sort of investment, they think that they have to vote for that politician because they did not deserve and that, that was a favor, you know, for them. So they do systematic committees, they report the shortcoming of the pro official projects, they seek international supporters and local supporters and so on. And it, it's been really uh, important for me to understand what they do and try to reinforce what they do. So intentionally or not, okay, this is the... the response to the main research question. Intentionally or, intentionally or not, I'm not judging if right to the city policies in Brazil was good or bad, but they have given space to new Liberian systems of values and beliefs. Uh, and I'm pretty proud of right to the city policies in Brazil, by the way. Uh, some movements are responding to that, and I've been calling them insurgents. So they, hedge the lease, which is their name, they are planning because they intervene in the city building process aiming at collective demands, even though they are not professional planners. Uh, they are also insurgents, not only because they occur outside the state, but because they respond to what um, Mirafat calls the new Liberia strategy of dominance through inclusion. You know, and yeah, that's it. Okay. And that's I hope some of this has bring a bell of you in similar processes around the world. You now I hope for you to teach me something. Do <laughs> you have any questions? Questions, comments? I have a question. At the beginning, you, you it seemed it seemed that th this was a, a process that's ongoing, and then you you mentioned, uh, and then the World Cup came, and so does did that disrupt this whole insurgent planning process or? No. It incited it? Or? No, I think it feed to a process that was already <coughs> there. So land was becoming expensive. And I think that World Cup was just an excuse for
or evicting a lot of people in, in informal houses from the more centrally located <coughs> neighborhood. In some sense, World Cup helped because it also brought the international community to support mm -hmm. these residents. So I don't think the World Cup is to blame. It was something that fed the, the process <coughs> that was already existing. In Fortaleza, actually, because I've seen similar things in other municipalities who did not uh, receive the World Cup investment. It was the, the the discourse of World Cup as like a catalyst for already existing economic mechanisms. Was that I mean, was that used like like you just said in other uh, municipalities? I mean, the idea that this is uh, this will be a catalyst uh, rather than uh, an intervention, you know. Or, yeah, it, it was used as a catalyst yeah. in, in that sense, yes. A catalyst for both, for pushing the exclusionary agenda and for uh, the movements to understand that, well, something is going on very bad in here and we have to, to fight, you know, we have to protest. So I think it was a catalyst for both. Mm. Oh, go ahead. Well, just because I, I feel like Michael asked that because I just came from my sport class <laughs> <laughs> and I was late, so I'm like trying to catch up and figure. But used by whom? I was really curious who was kind of using the World Cup. Like, what particular actors were talking about that? You know, one on one side or the other. Was it you know activists? Was it developer? You know, I, I don't know what exactly who the actors you had identified are, but I'm really curious who <coughs> was kind of speaking about sport and using it yeah, to make a Yeah, I'm talking in this paper about two specific stakeholders, the official planners, the state, and the movement. So the state used the World Cup investments to <coughs> evict, to concentrate investments in the face part of the city, okay? And the movement, by seeing clearly that the investments were not uh, in benefit of them, they were being evicted, and that neighborhood did not receive any World Cup investment because the World Cup was close to the coast. So the, the fact that the World Cup investment escape was also used by the movements to uh, spread the words on, on the residents that, you know, government doesn't represent us, official planning doesn't represent us, and we have to protest. So I think you already started answering the question I was going to ask a bit. But so let me be, sort of set it up by another example, that, which is the one that I know, which is Istanbul, and what's been happening there in terms <coughs> of urban planning and how sort of protests over a park in 2000, when now I forget, 3, 4, uh -huh. 2000, 11? Twelve. So, so there was a lot of effort to also yeah. try to understand it as a right to the city moment. But I think when I look at what's been happening in terms of um, how urban planning has been at the crux of, of a certain kind of politics, what the municipality or the government has been trying to do is almost switch around the former centers and peripheries of the city. So there is incredible infrastructure, especially public transport investment made to what was previously the outskirts in um, socioeconomic, cultural, so the recent migrants to the city, the poorer neighborhoods, the more pious neighborhoods, which were told in all sorts of ways that this is not your city, you're on its outskirts, come do your laboring and then and then go back. And, and so even when you take the metro, you will see all these commercials of, we connected you to the center. So, whereas there's also a lot of displacement from the center, sure. right? And, and the closing down of certain sites that have symbolic cultural political meanings, closing down certain sort of independent movie theaters and, and so on. But then when you have a moment like the Gezi protests, which really could take hold through the sheer police brutality, but in this first moment, you realize that there's something that these two groups are far from communicating to one another, because someone's losing the city and others are gaining it. So to talk about what it means to have a city together and to think of a right to the city has, has not been successful at all. And so from there to ask sort of what allows, and, and in a situation where sort of right to the city is politically represented for some groups 
who could see in it their representation in one way or another to pull away and to say, no, this is not exactly how we mean it. So how do you understand the way in which the community that you're looking at, for instance, could find this grounds of, of saying, that, no, this is not exactly what we meant, or mm -hmm. we object to these parts still, and what could be this politics that, that tries to mediate the complicated stakes in mold? Yeah. That is an important parallel, and, and it's nice for me to perceive that it rings the bell in, in, in other contexts, in other places throughout the globe. But it's exactly that. I mean, they, they push investments to the periphery, and they, they say that it's to the peripheral resident, but in the end, that investment is added either through market mechanism or so, or so ever. So your question was, uh, how, how about the perspective of the resident that could not see anymore that that rights are their rights? You know, the city refers to their needs and their demands. In, in Brazil, this was institutionalized, and we have registration, we have the statute of the city, we have all these legal, legalized uh, forms of defining what is right to the city. So they kind of resort to this progressive legislation to say, okay, the, we have conquered with a lot of struggle uh, under a technocratic, centralized government, we have conquered and, and democratized the country, and we have conquered this. We have a, this is our achievement, and now you are using it to 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 push for uh, something that does not meet my needs. So they, they do resort to this legislation, which that's why I'm really proud of it. But it, it is a mixed legislation. No, it 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 was internalized. It it did internalize the other agenda as well. Thank you for your talk, Clarissa. Very interesting. Um, kind of speaking to that point, uh, your paper mentioned something about um, the difference between a technical component and a political component. So the technical component, I think, was the quantitative data collected to see when future interventions could be made. Is that would that include data from the communities themselves, or is it just from the policies that are... See, yeah, the data. Data is something that I love. And, <laughs> and planning, planners love, and, but critical planners don't. And I can, I'm kind of the mis, middle of it. But yeah, when I talk about technocratic planning, it's using forecasts and numbers and techniques and GIS and so on to say what is the planning. And what we have planned for public interest. And by using that bunch of concept and that and number, they depoliticize because what they're saying that you don't understand me. So you have nothing to say, I have nothing to learn from you. So and, and actually when they do this, which I call technocratic planning, in technocratic language, they don't really uh, build a lot of knowledge about the informal settlements they means. You know, this is kind of very becomes very invisible. Informality or precariousness doesn't doesn't have any numbers and data and so on. So it's pretty much what they understand as the city, you know, not really what the real city is. Think about that to figure. So technocratic is that red uh, layer on that figure. So that's what I mean by technocratic. And and the way and the politicized is those groups who respond, okay, you're planning, but for whom? And, and so it's more of an inclusionary outcome. And, and what I I tend to want to understand myself as a technical person who helps them understand the technocratic language for them to fight. That, that is my utopia in my personal <laughs> utopia. <laughs> yeah. Can you say a little bit more about the mechanism of exclusion? So I'm thinking of, um, of the case of, for example, gender mainstreaming in, in international policy where um, many activists argue that by mainstreaming, there's a superficial inclusion, but there's not um, an in-depth engagement with, with issues of gender. Is that the mechanism that happens here, or is that the residents' input isn't incorporated, or is it, you know, so I'm trying to understand what is the mechanism of, of exclusion? Where does the breakdown happen from their <laughs> input to the policies? Uh, I'm not. See, gender is a big issue here because most of the community leaders are, are women, you know, the mm -hmm. people who occupy and all of that, and they are overlord with production and reproduction. 
uh, functions, but this is one of the components, but there's a lot of components playing out. I think, in, in my sense, maybe that's only my interest, my research interest, but in my sense, a big component is knowledge. Mm -hmm. That, you know, you, you don't know nothing about the city, why are you here? Mm -hmm. So there is this dismissal that you're just a resident that don't know nothing uh, about the collectivity interest. So I think the fact that they are not educated, you know, they don't have formal education, plays a big role in making them not being heard. So in all these meetings that I, I go to and take my, my middle class university students, you know, highly educated in private schools, and, and I go with the residents to uh, discuss with government, it's easy to see how government uh, make an effort to understand me or my students, but not the residents, you know? So I think knowledge is part of it, too. Formal. <laughs> Kind of continuing on that train, I'm wondering, can you give a bit more of kind of a longer context of Fortaleza? Um, sure. I think some people are, are uh, aware of it. Rio and, you know, <laughs> yeah. the favela sort of um, spatial organizations, but can you say a bit more about Fortaleza, but also in terms of these, are there longer, I would assume there are longer histories of dispossession or exclusion that residents are taking up and uh, policymakers are must be aware of it in some level but how is that shaping how this conversation can even take place or not yeah that that is a good point i i always have to introduce for is it to everybody it's not a very well known place mm -hmm. uh i've written my master thesis in fortaleza and i discussed a little bit of it uh, 15 years ago so uh, fortaleza is a capital of a very drought region so they have problems of drought, and the, these migrants were uh, ex escaping from, you know, the lack of opportunity in the, the countryside to the city, not only because it's a coastal city, but it's, it's mainly a trade city. They, all the roads go to this place, so we, have, we don't have much industry. We have now tourism, but before, you know, commerce and, and trade. So we've expanded by recent migration, actually, much Recent, re, more recent than Rio and Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. we, our boom happened during the 70s and 80s, whereas in Sao Paulo and Rio was during the 60s and 50s. And we even exported migrants. Hey, bye bye, bye. <laughs> <laughs> See you. <laughs> so we've exported poor migrants from the northeast to this more developed south. Mm -hmm. So the Lula PT uh, president. He was a um, migrant from the northeast to the developed south. So um, Fortaleza is like the periphery of the periphery in a lot of mm -hmm. sense, in, in that sense. So yeah, we favela residents are mainly migrants, recent migrants from the drought the countryside. Yeah. Folks, have any other questions for Clarissa? Hey, I'm just wondering about the zoning. You, you brushed on it quickly for, with the environmental section that they've zoned off. And I'm mm -hmm. just wondering how much is, of the zoning is really bad. Like, you know, here in the U.S. there's bad zoning where, you know, yeah. in certain economic status mm -hmm. folks can be and so whatnot. So I'm just wondering if, what the zoning policies look like there. We imported this major planning tool, which is zoning. Mm -hmm. but we also devised our own way of zoning, so we have, which is something I, I believe a lot, it's, it's what this model of inclusionary zoning, which is not really what you do here in the US, but you, it's actually protecting favela from being evicted, the way that favelas are zoned. So I, I feel that they are pretty uh, potentially progressive. But the thing is that it's difficult to zone in a context where state doesn't go there and actually enforce zoning. You know, so there's no enforcement of it. So the zoning, zoning uh, mechanism mostly functions as it functions in the U.S. to say, okay, you can build high-rise buildings in this plot, now your plot is a valuable and, and you know, very disputed land. So there, there is this whole politics of zoning, but the major difference is that we don't have the capacity to enforce it. 
whereas here the capacity is pretty much more uh, strong. So, yeah. Any other questions for Clarissa? All right, well, please join me in thanking her for her talk. Please feel free to grab some lunch if you haven't already, and perhaps Clarissa will be here for a few minutes if you want to yeah. meet her talk informally a bit. Thanks very much.